And now, the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. I have found over the years that there are three dimensions to good leadership and getting getting the best results um, that you can in business, but in a kingdom way. And those three words are love, serve, lead. Marsha Barnes on today's Bottom Line Faith. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Bottom Line Faith podcast, where we take a look at today's top Christian leaders in business and in the marketplace, and we sort of lift up the hood and tinker around a little bit and learn how they live, lead, think, and solve problems. I am your co-host, Ray Hilbert. My other co-host, Adam Ritz, is out of town on assignment today, and so I have the incredible privilege for this version of uh, Bottom Line Faith podcast to interview one of my closest friends in life, Marsha Barnes. Marsha, welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Thank you, Ray. And Marsha, we have had the opportunity to know each other over a number of years. I'm sure we'll get to some of that later, but why don't you take a moment and give our listeners a little bit of information on your background, uh, where you grew up, a little bit about your faith, how you came to Christ, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, I'm from a, a very small town in southeastern Indiana that's very small but very famous, Milan, Indiana. That's where the basketball team won the state championship in 1954. And Bobby the, Plump. Yes, that's right. right. And the foundation of the movie um, Hoosiers. I never really realized that was a big deal until I went to college. So that's often what happens to us is we're in the middle of something epic and we don't even realize how big it is going Mm. on around us. Um, My dad was in the eighth grade and at that game um, when Milan won that year. So we're from a rural farming community. Um, My dad was a farmer. I grew up as a farmer's daughter. Um, He actually worked a full-time job as well, so really big work ethic was instilled in myself and my two sisters as we were growing up. Um, We had um, a lot of um, poverty in our early life, you know, before my dad started doing both farming and working outside of the home. Um, so we struggled for uh, for money and for, um, for, you know, my parents struggled to make ends meet. And um, so I kind of beca- I became conditioned to have a respect for working hard and getting ahead. Um, we had some troubles um, inside our family with my mother. She had a drug addiction um, as we went through childhood together and um I ended up having a nervous breakdown from that and was abusive and so we got we experienced some brokenness in mm. that as well yeah. um the uh went to high school we went through went through grade school high school all of that went to indiana university to college studied journalism while i was there um came out of school i did not um, finish college i came out um, to get married and um, raise a family and um, I was a librarian at the time I left IU. I don't know if you knew that. that I don't I think a, I did know that. I was a librarian in another lifetime. I know you have a love for books and reading, so that makes a lot of sense. And order. I like things to be yes. in order, Ray. <laughs> you like to order me. I, know I can alphabetize <laughs> things like crazy. <laughs> so um, I transferred my job from Indiana University Libraries to Xavier University, and they had an opening coming up in a few months where someone was going to be on maternity leave. And so I had to wait for that job. And while I waited, I took a part-time job selling advertising over the phone. And um, my first week on that job, I broke the company sales record and made $1,500, which was more money than my dad was making uh, at Sigrams and in his job. So I thought I was big time, you know. I thought I had really arrived. But um, that that was the epic spot that caused me to go, I'm not a librarian anymore. <laughs> now I'm a salesperson. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I ended up getting into sales and marketing to start with. So I was living in Milan, Indiana, and then driving into Cincinnati, Ohio, to work every day on this sales job, which is about an hour and 15-minute drive. Mm-hmm. Um, so for a, for I was about to get married, and I couldn't see raising a family and doing that kind of drive. So I ended up um, getting some help and figuring out how to start a similar company on my own. That went well for a while, for a season, and we ended up ended up um, put, closing that business and me going on board working for someone else again. And then um, in 2000 or in 1991, my second child Ryan was born um, early, 16 weeks early, and weighed one pound and nine ounces at birth. 
So I had a lot of complications with that birth, which then it made sense for me to go back into business for myself again. So I did that. Um, that business um, did very similar work to mm-hmm. what we do today at Rhino, um, where we generate leads for other companies. We we did this that. This is in, all pre-internet, right? It is. Yeah, yeah it's sure. all pre-internet. Right. Yeah, because I'm that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, but yes. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's all pre-internet. And the way that you generated new customers then was through telemarketing. And yeah. so I had just this um, fantastic little group of team members in um, rural Indiana that were helping other businesses grow. And uh, one day, um, we, you know, we had about 12, 15 different clients and uh, one day I get a call from this guy. Um, his name was Dave Lindsay, and um, he was um, in the security business. He had a small company that he was running out of the out of the spare bedroom of his home. Over time, my partner retired, and then um, Dave Dave wanted to uh, wanted to my business to merge in with his, and I did that and became the director of marketing at his company. And I, I think at that time when it was about. Four years later, I think they were probably about $25 million when I officially joined the team. They were $2 million when I'd started working with them. And um, so I became director of marketing and then uh, a few years later became the CMO and sales and leadership and development and marketing all reported through me. In 2010, I became the president of Defender. And then in 2011, I became the president and CEO. And uh, when I left Defender in August of 2013, we were a $435 million company. Wait a minute. Let me get that straight. Yeah. You were a part of growing this company from roughly $20, 25000000 million when you were brought in-house, so right. to speak, right? When you sold right. your business into Serving Dave and, and right. Defender. And you left the company how long later and at what amount? Seven years later at $435 million in revenue. Friends, that's called growth. That's called grabbing the tiger by the tail, riding the big wave. And you learned a lot. And that's... Yeah. I had no marketing background. That's and, incredible. It, you know, and Dave and I figured it out. I I ran the marketing tests and figured out the marketing piece. And Dave and Jessica, his wife, Jessica, they are just terrific stewards of the blessings that God brings through the business. And yeah. they had prepared for a time where we might need to make phones ring in instead of dialing out when that no call list yes, came about. Yes, I remember that. And they they were able to then invest where others weren't. And um, and in their story is just remarkable. Of that starts with stewardship around tithing and 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 being good stewards of God's blessing to them. But also is embedded in Dave's um, very adept financial management of the business. He's really brilliant on that part. Well, Marsha, that, that is really exciting to hear about how God allowed you to be a part of uh, growth and leadership there. And we are speaking with Marsha Barnes, the CEO of Rhino Strategic Solutions. And Marsha and I have had the, the incredible uh, friendship for a number mm-hmm. of years. And so, Marsha, what I'd like to do is kind of transition our conversation to this living out your faith in business. Um, you are obviously the Lord has blessed you with incredible success and wisdom and experience, and yet there is a lot of intentionality that you have lived out over the years. And so let's let's kind of talk for a few moments uh, how you live out your faith and, and and those sorts of things. So why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe a couple, maybe two or three business best practices that you directly connect to your faith or to biblical principles or scriptures. T- tell us about that. Sure. Um, I I have found over the years that there are three dimensions to good leadership and getting getting the best results um, that you can in business, but in a kingdom way. Mm-hmm. And those three words are love, serve, lead. We're under a, a, a mandate, a commandment, not a suggestion, not it's a good idea, not this is the best workforce engagement process, but our Lord told us, Love one another as you love yourselves. And if you'll, ju- if you'll start there, fundamentally loving your people, seeing them as God's gift to you, looking into people's eyes instead of thinking about they didn't turn their paper in on time, their report in on time, they didn't respond to my email, they're not hitting their number. But first thinking, all those mm-hmm. things are important from a business perspective, but the most important thing for that individual who is called to serve inside your business 
is to understand that they're created in God's image and you're to love them. You know, we just have this desire in, 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 a, in a business to walk around, look at our people going, hitting a number, not hitting a number, hitting a number, not hitting a number, getting it done, didn't send me the report, didn't send me the email, didn't reply to my phone call, I don't like the way they're dressed today. That's not kingdom business. That's worldly business. Hmm. But kingdom business looks at their, our people and says, this person's created in the image of God. These are the strengths that they bring to my business. These are the things they've been called here to do. And this is how I will honor them in the way that I love them. We'll know we're doing that well because it can be confusing. Am I loving people well or not? And this is the sign I find is, 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 is present. When I'm loving well, I have this incredible desire to serve. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus tells us that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That service, modeling what the Savior did for us, it is the best type of leadership. When we love and we serve well, then people give us permission to lead them. And when we have their permission to lead them, we can accomplish anything together. So many people get that manager title or that VP title, and they say, now I've had the magic fairy wand waved over to me, and yeah, I am a yeah. leader. Little pixie dust is sprinkled, and pop, you're, you're ready to go. It's, that's not it. Love and serve, and then people will give you permission to lead. Now you have followership. That, that is absolutely fantastic, not only advice, but it's reality, and, and it's mm-hmm. scripturally rooted. I'm, as I'm listening, I'm thinking John Maxwell talks about the five levels of leadership, and that level one is positional leadership. I've got the title now, therefore I have the authority, but you're really speaking at the heart level. You're, you're going much, much deeper, and I can tell you firsthand, because you and I have been close friends for a long time, I know this is how you lead, and it was evident in the people around you. So what was that secret? So how could you stay there in that place of being about loving and serving, even amidst up and down numbers? Right. You understand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I understand it. Or another thing that happens even is change of position. Oh, yeah. Because every time that your position changes, you're resetting where you're, who you're loving, where you're loving, how you're serving. Um, and, and a lot of it is, um, is humility-based. You know, I always hate to say I'm trying to be humble because once we word it that way, we're not, (laughs) right? Right, right. right. Um, Probably one of the toughest transitions I've noticed this in is my transition to Rhino Strategic Solutions. You know, I went from a team that I had led for, uh, had a leadership role in for 14 years that's growing from 25 million to 435 million um, and 2,600 employees in 140 offices nationwide to a $2 million business with 20 employees with a couple of offices across the country. But I'm still walking around like I'm, I'm, I've got this, this $435 million label on me, right? And so you have to make that adjustment. You have to find where's my new footing to love and serve. Yeah. And so the only way to do that is to stay, stay firmly planted inside of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you stay inside the triune God, you'll know. You'll get your identity from the Lord. You'll get Jesus poking around on the things that need to be healed. Right. He'll come, he'll come in and help you with that part. And then you get the wisdom and, uh, and discernment of the Holy Spirit. So if you'll stay in that space in the Word and prayer and listening to God and watching for signs and seeking wise counsel and keeping good good company, all of those things work together to help you sustain an attitude that says, I'm here to serve. I'm here to love. If you if you let me lead you, it's going it's going to come out of this love and serve piece. You know, and I want to park there just for a moment. One just go one level deeper on the practicality of the intentionality of how you did this. So would you share maybe just two or three of those tangible ways? I, I, I know you sent cards, you, the way you would give bonus checks. There were some things that you practically lived out that modeled this whole idea of love, serve, and lead. Just give us a couple of examples. What right, that right. Like. You know, some of it is so it's, it's it's so much integrated into who we are as people in our families, in our churches, communities, and in our in our workspaces. Um, these are all things, all practices that can, can be used in those places. But everybody has a story, 
And people are bringing a story into your business and they're creating stories within your business. And maybe my librarian days made me a curator of the stories, mm -hmm. but I knew people's stories. I knew if they had been there 10 years, I knew what they had done that had moved that business from 25 million to 435 million. I could remind them of what they had done eight years ago that made a pivotal change for the business and how they were going to do that again. So knowing stories is really, really important. Um, another good best practice was um, we had about 100 people in the corporate office um, on, on the floor that I worked on that were the knowledge workers of the organization where big projects were being worked, IT and finance and marketing and all those places. Right, right. And every Friday I would walk desk to desk with a notepad and ask each individual, what are you working on today that's exciting? And over time, they got conditioned to be prepared to tell me about what they were working on that was exciting. And sometimes they would tell me about something that they'd had an idea about, and I could direct them where that idea could be worked on. Um, but it was a way of affirming people, of showing them, I see you. I see you contributing inside this organization, and I value it. Um, and every once in a while, you would uncover something that was, that was problematic, where I remember going to... Um, one, one lady's desk, and um, she said, oh, I just finished all the licensing that we needed to go into Canada. And um, we had made a decision three weeks earlier to pull out of Canada and the executive team and her executive leaders uh, cascading communication had not gotten to her yet. So she had been working on that for three weeks. And I'm like, I'm going to let the CFO get back with you on that. <laughs> you know? Like, oops, you know, so every once in a while, you know, you would, you would untangle something like that, but that's not why I was walking. Yeah, every once in a while, yeah. something like that would emerge. An outside observer from another business would think I was in there micromanaging and I wasn't, I was energizing the business, knowing people's names is a third thing I would say is just so incredibly important. Um, I, I, um, could, I got to where I could do that pretty easily with our teams. Um, and sometimes I would miss, but 2,600 people, I could name most of them by wow, first name if wow. they had been there for over 90 days. But I would have, if I was going to an event, I had my assistant make flashcards. You know, I made sure that I reviewed those before the event, and then I would just start to naturally be able to match stories and results with, um, I'd just start to be able to na match naturally stories and results with faces and names. And so that was a lot of fun. I had, um, I was at one event that was spouses were in attendance as well, <laughs> and my assistant had forgotten to make my flashcards. And I thought I had everybody. It was a group that I was pretty familiar with. And right at the end, I've got this big guy, big giant guy, over six foot tall, huge, and he is headed straight for me with this grin on his face, and I cannot, I'm running the files, <laughs> yeah. I cannot find his name, he's got a little bitty five foot two wife on his side, and here they come, and I cannot, I can't get it, I can't retrieve it, and I know I know it, and I know he knows I know it, and I put my hand out and I said, God, this one's all you. And as soon as he touched my hand, I said, hello, Scott, how's that promotion going in Burbank? I'm hearing fantastic things about what you've done on the thorough protection numbers there. And his jaw dropped and his wife turned to him and punched him on the shoulder and said, I told you she knew your name. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So that was a fun, that was a fun time with that. But knowing people's names is, is important. That's a sweet sound to people. People want to know that you yeah, know yeah. what they're doing on your behalf. And I would say to anyone who's a manager in a business, it is your job to make sure your boss knows what the people on your team are doing on his or her behalf the good things that they're doing on his or her behalf. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in these cycles of reporting what's not going right and things people are doing wrong. That's not what godly businesses do. That's not a kingdom orientation. Kingdom orientations look at what's going right and how are people being blessed. As I'm listening to that last comment there, there's a proverb that talks about knowing the condition of your flocks oh, so yeah. that you can serve it well. Perfect. So just as a wrap up, that, that, that little idea of business best practices. I, I heard three very important things. I just want to wrap up real quick. It's important to know the stories, know the backdrops, know where people came from, know what's important to them, know about them is what Marsha has taught us today. Secondly is know what your team is working on, know what your key leaders are working on, walk the floor, go to their offices and say, 
What are you working on that's exciting right now that's going to move the business and the organization forward? That's an incredible best practice. And then, as Marsha just shared with us, the importance of knowing names, that there's nothing sweeter to a person than hearing the sound of their own name. And that really indicates that you knew enough or, or that you cared enough to get to know their name. So those are terrific best practices. Well, Marsha, I want to now transition you know, as you look back over the course of your career, is there anything particular that if you had the chance to do it over again that you would do differently? If so, what would that be? I really wish that earlier in my career I had understood who I am in God's eyes. I, Say that again. I really wish that earlier in my career I had understood who I am in God's eyes. That's powerful. That I had gotten my, if I had gotten my identity from him earlier, um, instead of seeking it in success and money and measures and worldly evidence that we're successful, I wasted a lot of joy and I made a lot of problems for other people and missed a lot of kingdom opportunities by not seeking my identity and in, in how I was created and the one who created me. Um, I was running to-do lists. I was keeping the law. I was a fundamental textbook Christian. Yeah. And that led me to going, I'm winning, I'm succeeding, I'm in church, I'm in Bible study, I'm teaching a Sunday school class. And that led me into judging and criticizing and condemning and thinking my way was the only way. And it left very little room for love and grace for other people. Um, in the space where God got my attention on that, he was able to forge a new me and one that's open to kingdom concepts and one that's um, one that gets her identity from him and sees herself as the daughter of the king. You know, I spent all this time running around checking, checking off boxes of the things I was doing and how I was winning and comparing myself to others. And I missed the fact that I'm the daughter of the king and that he laid it down, all of it down, just for me. That is absolutely powerful, and, and I want all of our listeners to take that in for themselves, that you are a son, you are a daughter of the King Most High, and that makes you royalty, which gives you rights to certain things, and that's a yeah. relationship with the King and Most High in heaven. Yeah, there's a great Baxter Kruger quote that's that, you know, he's talking about, we mess our lives up, you know, and you've heard me talk about a couple of spaces where I got things messed up. And um, he says, there are two reasons why you are the way you are today. Um, one is because when God created you, it was because he always wanted a son just like you. Hmm. Or he always wanted a daughter just like you. And the second reason why you are what you are today is because you've forgotten who you are in him. <laughs> and you keep recreating yourself. And your recreations get in the way of you seeing who you are in him. And I just find that so powerful, you know, that when I'm trying to just get in there and wrestle with it and make it happen and dig in, that I lose track of really who I am in him. And there's so much more peace and joy in that space of being, I, being identified with Christ, with Christ and being identified in, in my maker's <laughs> eyes. That is absolutely fantastic. Well, man, the time is flying here. We're, we're uh, near the end of our bottom line faith uh, interview with Marsha Barnes, uh, CEO of Rhino Strategic Solutions. And Marsha, probably my favorite question that I get to ask on the Bottom Line Faith podcast is my last question here. And I, I just, for those of you who are familiar with the show, you, you, you know what this question is going to be, but uh, perhaps you're not. So I'm going to go ahead and set the stage. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, these are the words of Solomon. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. Now, Marsha, what we've discovered, there are some biblical scholars who believe that these may be some of Solomon's last words, that it's possible that he wrote these words even from his deathbed. And so we all know that if you're sitting next to a friend or a loved one and they're on their deathbed and they, they lean forward and they look in your eyes and they say, now, above all else, whatever is at the end of that those three words, you and I both know is going to be extremely important. They're giving you the summation of all their life and the lessons learned. So, Marsha, here's your chance to talk to perhaps thousands of Christians in business and in the marketplace, living out their faith, leading their families, their companies, and their organizations. 
What above all else advice would you give to them? I would go to this piece about seeking your identity in God. He's, if you'll ask him, this is, this is what I've learned. If you'll ask him, he's faithful in revealing it to you of who you really are in him. Um, that was a fascinating walk for me over the last few years in a course, in some courses that I've had here at Truth at Work and with Youth with a Mission of um, topics like listening to God. You know, I spent so much of my life praying. I prayed a lot because I was a good Pharisee, right? I was, mm. I was putting out all the checklists, and I'm a model Christian and all that. I was a really good yeah. Pharisee. And then somebody taught me listening, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I thought praying was about talking to God, and I hadn't, I hadn't stopped to listen. And uh, when I did that, he w- became very clear with me on who I am in him. And um, what we tend to, I, I tend to see people drive at perfectionism so much. And perfectionism will, it's our own interpretation of who we are. And it will it will make you ungodly really really fast. Wow. And so I think this space for me anyway, this space of trying to get my identity from my heavenly Father, and not from the world, and not from any one other person, not from a boss, not from a peer group, not from a friend, not from a spouse, not from my children, but to get my identity from the one who molded me and sent me here with specific strengths and specific gifts that he could use to advance the kingdom. When I do that well, everything else is easy. Those are incredible life-giving words from Marsha Barnes, who is telling us, above all else, gain our identity in Christ. And uh, Marsha, that is an exceptionally powerful words. Uh, and I've come to know you that uh, you actually throw out very few empty words. All the times and conversations we've had over, you're a life giver. And I just pray that uh, our, our guests, uh, our, our audience uh, on the Bottom Line Faith podcast are, are catching this today. Final words you'd have to share? Something I get asked a lot by young business people who are family folks weighs heavy on me about balance in life. My best parenting advice is it doesn't matter what you do. It only matters who you are. And that's back to this identity piece, isn't it? It is. If, if, you know, we all worry about, do I have my kids in the right schools and the right teams? Are they wearing the right clothes? Are they going to the right colleges? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? Am I reading? Am I preparing the right meals? Not that that stuff isn't important. They need nutrition and education and to be churched and all those things. But at the end of the day, they're going to become what you are. They're going to become your habits. So work there first. Get your identity from God and help pass that on to that next generation. They sure are. Well, folks, this is Ray Hilbert, and until next time, we'll see you on Bottom Line Faith. God bless, and we'll talk to you soon. Bottom Line Faith is powered by Truth at Work. You can learn more about joining a Truth at Work roundtable at truthatwork.org. Download and subscribe to episodes of Bottom Line Faith at bottomlinefaith.org.